Good morning, everyone. And welcome to this Sunday service of the Eno River Unitarian Universalist Fellowship. It's good to be with you all this morning. We are located on the ancestral lands of the Eno, Sisipaha, Shikori, Sipani, and Lumbee people. I am Reverend Patty Hanneman. I'm a member of this congregation, and I'm serving as the transitions minister here until Reverend Brett returns in August. I want to thank everybody that has helped make this Sunday service very special, our sound crew, tech team, everyone in the chancel this morning. Thank you for being here and for helping um, make this a special Sunday morning. And to the rest of you for being here as well, whoever you are, whether you are a brand new person here for the first time, or you're a longtime member or anywhere in between, we are glad that you are with us this morning. So welcome. And if you are brand new, uh, if this is your first or second time or you're fairly new, I invite you to stand now or just wave your arms so that we can give you a resounding welcome. Thank you. The Generosity Sunday Committee has selected the organization Threshold as the recipient of this morning's offering. Threshold is a welcoming place for adults with serious mental illness in Durham County. And as part of a caring community, it helps with vocational, educational, social, recreational, and housing needs. Each individual gets support they need to find a meaningful life of their choice in our community. We welcome uh, Elizabeth Barber this morning, who's the executive director of Threshold, and she will share with us a little bit more about the organization later in this morning's service. Welcome, Elizabeth. Let's take a moment now to center ourselves Turn off our cell phones and other electronic devices if we need to do that. And let's take a couple of deep breaths together. Breathing in the energy of this beloved community we share. Breathing out any concerns or feelings that may keep us from being fully present to this experience. We take another deep breath in and out again. And let us begin our worship together. and strife so let us try while we are here to make some sense of life we're neither pure nor wise nor good we'll do the best we know We'll build our house and chop our wood and make our garden grow and make our garden grow. Let 
dreamless dream, what world they please may heaven and earth be found. The sweetest flower, the fairest trees are grown. Because the tides are rising, so must we. Rise to this moment, rise to this day. Rise to this life, this place in the web that is yours and ours. Rise because the earth remains our only home and we fellow travelers is only hope for healing, wholeness, salvation. Rise before the mystery, before the Big Bang that started it all, that this infinite universe still takes notice of us, still feels the in and out of breath, still holds us, connects us. Rise or surrender with gratitude for this beauty this chance to be a part of it all. To weave life, past, present, future, everywhere, always, as one. Come, let us worship together as we light our chalice as a beacon of hope in these challenging times. Please stand as you are able as we sing our first hymn together for the beauty of the earth. The words will be on your screen here. Sister, brother, parent. 
barren child for the kinship we all share for all gentle thoughts and mild source of all truth Greet your neighbors. So I would like now to invite all the children and young at heart to come join me in the chancel here for a little bit of time together. Come on down. Good morning. Good morning. Hi there. Everybody that wants to come down can join us. Hi, it's so good to spend this time with you this morning. So I have our wonder box here, and most of the services that I'm going to be leading, I'm going to have the wonder box. Um, and we will start your, your classroom experience actually here with the Wonder Box with you asking me, I wonder what's in the box. So you wanna ask me that question? I wonder what's in the box. Okay, let's see. So first of all, first thing I have is a book called The Lorax. Is anybody familiar with this book? Yeah? Can you tell me what it's about? Who can tell me what this book is about? Other than The Lorax. <laughs> it's a Dr. Seuss book. This book, believe it or not, was pu first published the year that I graduated from high school. Can you imagine 1971? And it was just a few years after the first Earth Day celebration, which happened when I was in high school. And it was Dr. Seuss's um, intention to draw, atten draw our attention to environmental problems. And it's about um, people cutting down a tree called what? What kind of tree is in this book? Anybody know? Truffle of trees, right? Okay, the truffle of trees are all getting cut down, and I wish we had time to read this whole book to you, but we don't this morning. Um, so I'm just gonna tell you a little bit about what's in it. The truffle of trees are, cut, are being cut down to be turned into thneeds. And they're witnessing the disappearance of the brown barbalutes, the swami swans, and the humming fish. And the reason for this is because of all the biggering 
and biggering and biggering that's happening in the world. It tried to draw people's attention to our obligation of taking care of the earth that has been sustaining us for a very, very long time. Who can tell me how the book ends? Anybody remember how the book ends? I'm gonna read the end of the book to you because it tells us what we can do about the big ring. These are the last two pages. It says, but now, now that you're here, the word of the Lorax seems perfectly clear. Unless someone like you cares a whole lot, nothing is going to get better. It's not. So, Catch calls the Wunzler and he lets something fall. It's a truffle seed. It's the last one of all. You're in charge of the last of the truffle seeds, he says. And truffle trees are what everyone needs. Plant a new truffle, treat it with care, give it clean water, and feed it fresh air, grow a forest. Protect it from axes that hack, and then the Lorax and all of his friends may come back. I have one other thing in the box this morning. What is this? Yeah. It's water, it's clean water. And I see Kathy has brought some clean water as well. Yeah. Um, I brought this as a reminder that one of the things that we can do to, um, to help the world be a better place is to make sure that everyone has clean water. And I'm gonna, we're gonna show you a picture up on the screen here. Anybody recognize these folks? <laughs> this is our youth group and their advisors who uh, last week were helping to clean trash out of the river as a way of giving back to our community, as a reminder that yes, sometimes we not only need to pick up our own stuff, but we need to pick up the stuff of other people as well. Isn't that, aren't they amazing? They remind us too that, um, I used to tell my children at home that environmental justice begins in your own house when you remember to pick up your stuff. <laughs> but then we also have to pick up after other people too to make this world a better place, right? So in your classroom today, you're gonna be talking about water justice and how important it is um, to remember that not everybody has the luxury to turn on a tap and get clean water as we did this morning. So I invite you now to go to your classroom and we will sing you out of the sanctuary as you, as you leave our sanctuary. So thank you for listening. Go now in peace. Go now in peace, may the love of God surround you everywhere, everywhere you may go. Vayan and pass, vayan and pass, we dial a more dielo siempre, por doquier. Good morning, everyone. My name is Elizabeth Barber. Um, 
As I was introduced, I am the executive director of Threshold in Durham. Um, and I am very grateful uh, for you, to you all for inviting me to represent Threshold this morning for Generosity Sunday. Um, and thank you to Jane for um, nominating Threshold to, to be here. Um, we are a clubhouse program in, in, um, located in Durham. Um, we have a sister clubhouse program in uh, Chapel Hill, Carlboro called Club Nova. Um, and Threshold is located in East Durham. We're part of a clubhouse model that is worldwide. And we understand that mental health recovery is a lifelong process. And so um, we're serving adults um, ages around right now, we're serving folks that are about 20 to 72. So we have a really large age span. Um, they come to us, again, mostly from East Durham. Um, most of them are living at or below the poverty level. And um, these are individuals that are living with a mental health diagnosis, so they have been um, throughout their lives journey working with the challenges that come with a mental health diagnosis. So um, problems with finding employment or keeping employment, um, difficulties and challenges in having housing and maintaining housing, and, and many different challenges. And they come to threshold um, to uh, experience recovery. Threshold is a very uh, welcoming place. We welcome everyone um, at whatever ability they are experiencing. And we work with them to develop skills and to um, develop community that supports them in all aspects of their life. So like all clubhouse models, we do have specific work units that when people come to the um, threshold that they participate in. Um, members are involved in every aspect of the clubhouse, so they join our board, they're in all of the meetings, and um, every day we work together, staff and members, to make meals um, for one another. Um, we work in an administrative unit to perform different publicity um, tasks and to help people learn about clerical tasks. And we have an employment unit where everyone can learn job readiness skills, can get opportunities for ongoing education. And we have our flagship employment program. And I do have um, brochures about that if you'd like to read about them after you leave today. Our flagship employment program is our transitional employment program where we work with local businesses. Um, we maintain a position for the business and we recruit and retain threshold members in those positions. Um, and they hold them for about six to nine months and then a lot of times they'll move into permanent positions um, or they transition out into other transitional employment positions. Um, and we're really proud of that. So I, Threshold is a place where people come and it really transforms them. Um, we have a member there now who came to Threshold and she had never uh, been out of her family home, had never been employed. And now, after six years, she's been working at the Durham County Library. She has a permanent job there. She found her partner at Threshold, and they live independently now. And she says Threshold has really changed her life um, in so many ways. We have another member who came to Threshold and did not speak, um, and came in and just sat at Threshold and would not engage. And about six weeks later, um, he was engaging with all members and staff by name. He was cooking in the kitchen. And um, he is now also participates in a lot of our social work activities and, and loves to dance for everyone. So I just wanted to give you those two examples to just share with you that Threshold is a really wonderful, transformative place. Um, and uh, we're very grateful to you all for considering Threshold as a giving opportunity this Sunday. Um, and I'll be happy to share more with any, anyone after the, the service. Thank you so much. Uh, 
I can say as a mental health nurse, threshold is needed in the community. Thank you. This reading is The Miraculous Picture by Barbara Road. During the hot Nebraska summers of my childhood, I spent hours high in the treehouse devouring the books I found in the small collection my parents had acquired from the estates of various relatives. One of my favorites was a wonder book, Nathaniel Hawthorne's retelling of classical myths. My favorite of those stories was the miraculous picture, the story of Bacchus and Philemon. This elderly, poor, but generous-hearted couple invite two gods disguised as beggars to come to their cottage to rest and eat. The gods keep asking that their bowls be replenished and the old couple became sad and embarrassed because they know the picture is empty. But the gods show them otherwise. No matter how often they pour from the picture, it is always full. I suppose that as a child, what I liked was that the thought of possessing such a picture much later, I realized that in some sense, I did. The story of the miraculous picture seems to be telling us that in the realm of spirit, there is no such thing as a non-renewable resource. That is an important concept. Most of us have it backward. For centuries, we have had it backward. We have believed that material resources are infinite, but the resources of the spirit need to be hoarded with care. We act as if the supply of oil can go on forever, but that there are limits to the amount of love we can give away. How often I have found myself closing off from people in need because I was afraid of being spiritually drained, only to find myself in the driest of deserts. We have arrived at a time in our history when we are beginning to realize that this planet is our only home. We can no longer make a mess of the place where we are and then move on. A species can come to an end. Resources can be used up. All growth is not a sign of health. But I suspect we doubt more than ever the truth in the story of the miraculous picture or the loaves and the fishes. We find it hard to believe that we will find the spiritual nourishment to meet the needs of this chaotic age. The wisdom of the centuries and our own experience tell us otherwise. If we do not let our fears have dominion, we may discover that in the midst of pain, we will inner, find inner strength. In the midst of bewilderment, we will find clarity. In the midst of nourishing another, we will find ourselves nourished. Good morning. Please uh, join me for a time of meditation and prayer. May we listen deeply for what speaks truth to our hearts as I share these words by Helen Weaver. 
Our Mother Earth, blessed is your name. Blessed are your fields and forests, your rocks and mountains, your grasses and trees and flowers, and every green and growing thing. Blessed are your streams and lakes and rivers, the oceans where life began, and all your waters that sustain our bodies and refresh our souls. Blessed is the air we breathe, your atmosphere that surrounds us and binds us to every living thing. Blessed are all creatures who walk along your surface or swim in your waters or fly through your air for they are all our relatives. Blessed are all people who share this planet, for we are all one family, and the same spirit moves through us all. Blessed is the sun, our day star, bringer of morning and the heat of summer, giver of light and life. Blessed is the moon, our night lamp, ruler of the tides, protector of all women, and guardian of our dreams. Blessed are the stars and the planets, the timekeepers who fill our nights with beauty and our hearts with awe. O oh, great spirit, whose voice we hear in the wind and whose face we see in the morning sun, blessed is your name. Help us to remember that you are everywhere and teach us the way of peace. Blessed is our beloved community, the convergence of many hands, hearts, and minds, together seeking to live out our Unitarian Universalist principles as community. We celebrate our joys and hold in our hearts all who are navigating the challenges of life. May we continue to support our staff and lay transition teams as they guide us during this in-between time of change. May we stay centered in our thoughts and actions amidst the many concerns of our hearts. We gather these blessings and concerns along with our own unspoken prayers and join our hearts together for a time of silence. Amen, Ashe, blessed be.
This morning, I began a, a series of reflections on congregational life. Over six Sundays this summer, I'm gonna be using the parts of a house as a metaphor for this um, community building project. And together they will um, we'll be discussing different um, classical theological issues. Together they will provide a kind of a framework for the role of faith communities in sustaining a house of hope. I am loosely um, focusing my, my sermons on a book called A House for Hope by Rebecca Parker and John Behrens um, that goes through these, these different theological themes. And today we begin with the garden, which represents how progressive people might think about the earth, our home, the earth that we come from and return to. And then next week we're going to be talking about the roof, which, uh, which will represent how we, um, what can protect and repair or restore lives and community. We'll next talk about sheltering walls and what it means to gather as a sheltered community and the promises that we make to each other. We will then talk about the foundation of our house, which will represent the sources we use to guide us in wisdom and what it means to live in a progressive, liberal faith tradition. The welcoming room is next kind of a parlor, what used to be called the parlor, where we welcome people in, and what that means to welcome people who enter our doors. And then finally, the threshold of the house, representing our call to take what we have learned here to extend our values out into the community beyond our walls. So this is the framework we're going to be using this summer. And while I'm not gonna be providing the specifics about how this congregation should address each of these theological issues, because that will be up to your congregational leaders and your new staff, I do want to instead just draw your attention this summer to the complexities and the nuances of what it means to build a faith community that is life-giving and hope-sustaining within a progressive and liberal context. So this morning I begin with the garden, the natural world that surrounds the house that we're going to be building over the summer. I want to draw your attention to our seven principles. If you're not familiar with them, they are found close to the beginning of the gray hymnal. So um, you may want to look in there if you're not familiar with them. And as we do that, um, notice that these are statements that we as Unitarian Universalists are asked to promote through our actions. They're not belief statements, they're action statements. And notice that the first one asks us to promote the inherent worth and dignity of each and every person. I'm gonna be par paraphrasing these as I go through the list. We begin with the individual and then we move to the acceptance of our individuality and then to justice and equity the search for, um, the individual search for truth and meaning, the use of the democratic process to give each individual a voice, the goal of world community, and lastly, respect for the inter interdependent web of which we are a part. You might notice as we go through this list, what, a, what an enlightenment era document this is. Um, because moving, we're moving from individual rights and freedoms to proper relationships between people, and then lastly, 
a recognition of the web of life, a focus of the, on the individual to be self-governing and self-sustaining has been the bedrock of enlightenment thinking and the progress that we have made through the years as a result has truly been astonishing. But even astonishing ideas have their shadow sides. As a result of this fairly intense focus on the individual, this has often led to an unwillingness or an inability to see our well-being as being linked to the well-being of others and to the well-being of our environment. Many Unitarian Universalist thinkers over the years have speculated about what our movement might have actually looked like had we reversed these principles. And if we could have acknowledged that everything follows from our interdependency. Faith communities have sometimes given us guardrails to constrain the worst excesses of individualism. But even we, arguably one of the most progressive of religious movements, even we list the interdependent web as almost an afterthought in our principles and the actions that we agree to promote. And so I begin here in the garden as kind of a corrective to that. On the sacred ground we inhabit with all that lives and breathes with us. I am not an environmental scientist, and I suspect that there are many of you here this morning who know more about uh, the environmental crisis that we face than, than I do. And if you need to know more about that, or if you want to be an activist in that role, I suggest you get in touch with someone that's on our environmental justice team. They can give you much more information about that than I can. What I want to focus on this morning will be environmental theology. What our wisdom traditions teach us about what it means to tend the garden. It is well worth the effort to make a serious and direct study of earth-centered spirituality, one of our wisdom traditions in this regard. The Western traditions that we are most familiar with has for centuries focused on a vertically linear cosmology with God on the top and then human beings next, animals after that, plants after that, everything in kind of a neat place so that there's an order to um, who or what we can take advantage of. Earth-centered traditions, on the other hand, see the universe as arranged in a web of relationship in which all beings stand in relation to all others whether distantly or intimately, and that all of us, therefore, have a responsibility for those relationships, all of those relationships. The divine is not something or someone who watches from a distance, but is rather nearer than our breath present in all beings and at all moments, each being having its own story and being necessary for the balance of the world as a whole. This cosmology is much closer to how science tells us our universe actually operates. 
Life as an interdependent web is much more complicated than our Western top-down cosmology. It asks us to be mindful about what we use and how we use it. It asks us to remember that when any piece of the web vibrates, you will feel it. And any time you create a vibration in the web, others will feel it also. It's very complicated. And while earth-based traditions are an important source for connecting us theologically with the earth, it's not, they're not the only ones. There's plenty of theological material um, around our relationship with the earth in our other sources. And this morning I want to just mention another source of our wisdom, which is our Judeo-Christian tradition. In the Hebrew scripture, scriptures in particular, there's a lot of information about how we should care about our environment. I'll just mention a couple of stories, a couple of myths. Particularly in Genesis, the beginning of the biblical origin myth, God takes a handful of earth. In Hebrew, the word is Adama. He takes a handful of earth and he breathes life into it to create the first human being, a creature from earth infused with the spirit. But then what happens in the garden? This earthling is given everything needed, and the earthling becomes two earthlings. But the earthlings are given limits to the use of all this goodness. Use only part of what you find here, God says, which will be more than enough for you. But as you know, that story doesn't go so well, right? And I'm not going to talk about who said what to whom. I think that part of the story, that little part of the story has been overdone and, um, and mostly you know, used to feed the patriarchy, so I'm not gonna go there. <laughs> but the fact is that it was the greed of the human beings of not being able to accept the limits of all this bounty. That was what cast the earthlings out of the garden, a garden where what they had already was enough. And then things get worse from there. There is jealousy and greed and power struggles, 60-hour work weeks, broken relationships, and the earth becomes filled with violence because of the fact that the creatures can't seem to accept having just enough. So a flood is sent, and it is time to start over to see if we can stay within our boundaries the second time around. I find the parallels between these myths and our present day situation to be pretty chilling. In each, the misuse of natural resources and the violence that follows bring ecological destruction. In each, the destruction threatens not only the human beings that cause it, but everything around it. And in each, we have floods and deluge of rain and powerful rising of the waters that result from all this misuse. And in each, it is only the act through the actions of those who are willing to clean up the mess that they didn't make in the first place that life is saved. What does it mean to tend the garden. 
The myth of Adam and Eve in the garden only to be cast out is the basis for the Christian atonement theory, the belief that our salvation and our return to paradise rests in the belief in a savior, someone beyond ourselves, and a paradise beyond what we have here in this world. But what if we instead could affirm that we are already in paradise? That we are in fact in the garden already, standing on holy ground every day of our lives. And that our salvation, if we wanted to call it that, lies in recognizing ourselves as part of the interdependent web, a place of indescribable beauty and abundance when we are able and willing to know our limits and forget about the biggering, biggering, biggering. What if we could see our problem as not having been cast out, but rather forgetting our place in the family of things? We never needed a God to turn us out of Eden. We, in fact, turn our backs on it. We walk away whenever we forget that we walk on sacred ground every day of our lives as part of this miraculous web of life. And this turning our backs is a theme that we will keep coming back to over the summer. What does it mean to turn our backs on paradise? With this in mind, our response then begins with a deep gratitude for what is. There will always be snakes in our garden. Snakes trying to convince us that we need more to be satisfied. But I believe that having a sense of this world as being enough is really critical now, and it may in fact be the only thing that can lower our anxiety that is fueling our consumption. I think that if we begin by recognizing through these myths and through a cosmology of interdependence, we can remember our proper place If we remember that we are Adama, made of earth and not separate from it, then this might lead us to embrace a deeper vision of relationship and possibly even remember to be grateful for being born into such a magical world. This is my hope for all of you. May it be so. Amen. Ashe and blessed be. And now I would like to call the ushers down as we take up our morning offering for Threshold.
the rhythms of his feet. I hear the neighbors whisper as he hurries on his way. But he is welcome here today. Thank you for your gifts this morning. And now I invite us all to stand together as we sing our closing hymn, The Earth Was Given as a Garden. to live. May the heavens above continue to live. May the rains continue to dampen the land and may the wet forests continue to grow. Then the flowers shall bloom and we people shall live again. Go in peace, my friends. <laughs>